Okay. All right, let's start. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we have a special EDI, EDI colloquium uh, with uh, Professor Angela Johnson from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Professor Johnson got her degree from University of Colorado Boulder in 2001 in educational foundations and in, in, in anthology. She's right now professor of educational studies and a department chair of uh, educational studies department. Okay, her specialty is, is a woman of color, color, the study in women of color in science. And today she's going to talk to us about uh, best practices and uh, what we, what, we can, what we can do to enhance uh, our diversity and inclusions. Okay. Before, we, before I hand the microphone to Professor Johnson, let me remind you of uh, our, um, how we, sorry, online etiquette of uh, Zoom meetings like this. Okay, so here's the guidelines for today. So we are here to learn. So please, please feel welcome to ask questions after the talk. Uh, I think, I, I believe the, uh, um, the chat, if you, if you put anything in chat, it only goes to the, to the organizers, right? Okay, right, but you can, you can ask questions on your chat in the, in the chat window. Please respect that this talk touches upon subject that can be intense or upsetting. It's okay to disagree, but please be considerate and do not uh, negate other people's experiences. Please consider the three Ps, power, privilege, and pos positionality when you, uh, interact with other people in, in, the, in this kind of online session and as well as uh, in-person sessions. Please join the discussion without uh, interrupting others and be succinct so that we can hear from as many people as possible. Okay, with that, without further ado, I'm going to hand, hand the microphone to Professor Johnson. Hi everyone. Before I um, share, I just want to Look at all the people on here. This is exciting. There are a lot of folks. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I'm glad to be presenting today. This is the first day here in Maryland that I've been able to have to work from my porch. And so I, some of you who were here early saw me realizing I could move to a different place outside. It's so beautiful. Um, I loved the uh, rules that you all have set for this colloquium. My own goal during these difficult years of increasing partisanship in my own country has been to try to listen to other people in order to understand their views rather than to listen to them in order to disagree with them. And I hope you all will give me that you'll lend me that approach while I'm speaking. I've tried to design a talk that will both help shine a light into how um, anthropologists study cultural settings, but will also give you all some ideas for what you can do yourselves as you think about your own department and how it is and how you could envision it being. Okay, so I'm an anthropologist. That means that the data I look at is what people do, what they say, and the objects they use. I, <laughs> when I first came to anthropology from having been a high school and then a high school physics teacher, I was like, what are these people doing? So this is what these people are doing. We're looking at what people say, do, and use, and we're looking at those things to deduce their shared beliefs and expectations in bounded identifiable groups. Sometimes it's pretty hard to bound them, but in groups that you can recognize as a group, even if out at the edges, it's getting fuzzy. So in this case, I'm gonna talk about how a person could, the person being me, could use what people say, do, and use in physics classes and departments to figure out the underlying logic that's structuring those settings. <laughs> so this slide says exactly what I just said to you all. Okay, here are some examples that really help me. For example, Angela, yes. Can we okay. share the slides? 
I'm not sharing them. No. Oh, no. Just a minute, everybody. Zoom failure because I, after all this time of living on Zoom, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't see y'all, but I was just talking away. Okay, hold on. Let me get the right. Now this looks like I expected it to. Hold on. Look, here's my slides, what people do say and use. Shared beliefs. And to deduce from those uh, speech behaviors and objects, the rules that people share. Thank you all for your patience with me. Okay, some examples that really helped me understand this. I lived in Central America for a while and I could never figure out how to cross the road. <laughs> if I was in a village, it didn't matter because everybody was just patient. But if I was in the city, I never learned whatever rules people were following to know when they could walk across the street safely. And eventually I just had to find somebody else going across the road and go when they went. Um, I was never able to figure out those cultural norms. Another example that my students always really grasp right away is when we go into a public bathroom, we start using a lot of rules we don't even know we're using to figure out which stall we should use. A lot of rules about which stalls are already occupied and how many people are in line and just a bunch of secret rules that nobody ever taught us, but we know them because we're members of the same culture with the same bathroom stall rules. Uh, so I'm gonna talk today <clears throat> about a concept that I'm calling identity. But it doesn't mean identity in the sense of how a person thinks of themselves. Or it means, in the way I'm using it today, it means a role that already exists in a setting or that a person could create in a setting which, in, in which they are seen as belonging in the setting. Um, it can also be a role that exists in the setting that people don't want to be pushed into, but that others are trying to put onto them. And that, I'll give you some examples. The first one is something I think is often wrongly called imposter syndrome. Like I remember the first time I went to teach a class, I was really worried that people wouldn't buy into me as the teacher. I thought, and I thought I was having imposter syndrome, but a different way to look at that is to say, I wasn't sure I could assume the identity of teacher and have students accept me in that identity. Another possible role that I always hated was, you don't wanna be seen as the person who sits in the very front row in class and is like the suck up to the teacher. But sometimes if I was over eager in my questioning in class, that's a role that people put on me. I hope that those two examples help you understand um, the way that I'm using identity right now. <laughs> Oops, hold on. So group members can try to force one an another into identities. They might do it consciously or unconsciously. Members of a group might not like the identities they're pushed into. They might not be accepted in the identities they want to assume, and they might try to create new roles in the setting, a new identity. All this is taking place in the middle of larger cultural arenas. So for example, one way you could picture it is here's your classroom. In this classroom, you are trying, you're a student, let's say, and you're trying to assume the identity of a, of a physics student who belongs there, like a person who is regarded as belonging in physics. This class is taking place in the context of a department, which is in the context of a university, which is in maybe the next layer up would be Canadian physics culture. You're going to have to think about what you think about this. Maybe the next layer from that would be Canadian culture at large. Maybe it would be physics culture at large. Think about what you think, because I'm going to argue that while this diagram looks cool, I think it has at least two problems. The first problem I see is that I think it's too top down. I don't think that culture pours from a higher level, cultural rules pour from a higher level down and down into the classroom. I think it's messier than that. 
And I also think you can create things in a classroom that have never been seen in any of these other spheres. A great example of that for those of us who are professors is the way that all of a sudden we have non-binary students. It's a, and that was coming from somewhere, but it was certainly not filtering down this way. Just, it was a new kind of student that just burst onto the scene. It's been kind of fun and exciting. I don't think this picture is very good. I'm gonna show you a different picture. I want you all to be picturing, making a picture in your own heads. Okay, so what about this? Is it possible that the culture of a particular physics class is the intersection of these three things? I don't really like this picture either. I made a lot of pictures when I was thinking about this slide. Uh, the reason I don't like this picture is that I think it's, We've all had classes that were new, were something totally new. So I tried another picture. What about if all, I'm not even sure these are the right things in the circles. You all think what you think are the things that have the biggest impact on the culture of your classroom. So what about if all these things have an impact, but they are not determinative? The problem with that is lots of these things influence each other. I spent a lot of time with this picture thinking about where to put two-sided arrows and where to put just one-sided arrows. So what about if your class culture is influenced by Canadian culture, which also influences global physics culture, which also influences the goals and expectations of the faculty? And you can see what I'm talking about. So here's your culture where people are doing saying and using things according to certain rules and members of the culture are trying to position themselves in certain identities and are trying to position one another in certain identities you know just trying to interpret one another in different roles one of the ways that no no one of the ways that one of the aspects of these greater levels with whatever we decide the picture is or whatever you think the picture is for how they all relate one of the aspects that affects or can affect how people are interpreting one another is the things you can read on their bodies and that's why the next thing i'm going to talk about is intersectionality to me intersectionality is a tool that can help us understand what happens when people are assuming or being pushed into or being interpreted through various identities. Uh, the big insight from intersectionality is that different people can experience the same setting differently based on where they fall in what Patricia Hook Collins calls the matrix of oppression. I have a quote from Collins um, that I'll let you all stare at for a moment particular forms of intersecting oppressions, oppression cannot be reduced to one fundamental type, but they oppressions work together to produce injustice. Okay. I like to think of intersectionality in terms of a coordinate plane. So you take any human characteristic that could have a high value and a low value, let's say you take gender. And then I've put myself right here. You can't read my whole body because you're seeing me through Zoom, but trust me, I fall on the feminine, but not very far into the feminine side. I picked another characteristic that might affect my access to power and opportunities. I picked social class. Look, there's me. <laughs> Again, I'm not, I'm above the line now because I'm out of grad school. When I was a kid, we were more down here, but I am not in the 1%. And then, because it's cool, I put a bunch of other circles where you all could picture yourselves. And Collins argues, and I'm gonna argue, that the location you are in this n-dimensional space can have an impact on whether you are interpreted as belonging in a setting and whether you feel you belong in the setting. So 
for yourselves, think about what you think the z-axis would be. What has had the biggest effect on your journey through social settings? For me, I think it's a, I think I actually need four dimensional space because I think it is both race and sexuality because as a lesbian, it's, there've been some rough times, but as a white woman, I've just walked in and been white so that I've been in most of the settings I've been in, I've just been average or normal or without race almost. So back to identity the less access you have to power in the matrix of oppression, the more group members may push back on letting you in the group. That is a fundamental assumption I'm making, and I'm going to show you why I make that assumption that structures the rest of the talk. Okay, in practice. In the US, Black women and Latinas are profoundly underrepresented in US undergraduate physics departments. Uh, here's a slightly old data now because of the pandemic, uh, but you can see uh, the y-axis is the percent of undergraduates receiving physics degrees from each of these categories. So you can see around 16% are white women, around 1%, about 1.5% are Latinas and about 1% are black women. That's not many. They're profoundly underrepresented and that would not matter if they were having the same kinds of experiences as, as other physics students, but apparently they are not. The data I'm gonna show you next comes from a study by my friend Mia Ong. She's interviewed, uh, she interviewed over a number of years about 17 black women and Latinas who were majoring in physics. And of them, she didn't ask them these questions. Spontaneously, 13 of those women talked about finding their time in physics discouraging and isolating. And 15 of them reported microaggressions. And we're gonna look at some examples. This is a quote from Mia saying, regardless of their actual abilities, these women perceived the message that because they didn't look like a scientist, they lacked the intellectual competence associated with being a scientist. Here's a quote from one of her participants, the little things like you walk in and there's no one there, but whites and Asians, it's all men, there's one female. It's subliminal and it's not something the university does, but the message is you're not supposed to be in physics. Here's another isolation quote where the woman found herself wondering whether the lack of people like her reflected on their abilities. And here's a description of a microaggression. This one is a little painful because possibly, even probably the people doing it thought they were helping. But this woman reported that other physics students spent more time trying to help her than they did trying to help other people. That was the rough part of this study. Now I'm gonna to report to you about research I've done in a physics department that was not as bad as what we've just talked about, let me just say. Okay, here are some quotes. This is the first quote is from a black woman saying, it doesn't feel like I'm out of place. The next quote is from a mixed race woman saying, it's been a really great experience in majoring in physics. These are really different than the quotes Mia was collecting. So the question I ask myself is, what are the available identities in this setting that let them have these pretty positive experiences and what could other people do to replicate it? I looked at this I built a framework to look at this using another idea from Patricia Hill Collins, which is the domains of power. She argues that power gets hashed out and distributed in society on four levels. First, the one that we're all, we're all comfortable with, which is the interpersonal domain where people interact with one another. Next is the cultural domain, which is shared ideas. 
Next is the structural domain, which is policies and practices uh, that guide and structure an environment or a setting. And the fourth is the disciplinary domain, which is the rules and regulations, what gets punished or rewarded in a setting. So this is what I said to myself. I said, let's, I started by thinking of the worst stereotypical bad physics department I could think of. And I asked myself, what would it look like on the interpersonal domain? And I said, based on Mia's research, women of color experience, isolations and microaggressions. On the cultural domain, the belief is physics is a competition and people succeed by being a natural genius. In the structural domain, I'm pulling this from a piece a pretty pivotal study in the US called talking about leaving whose findings have been replicated over and over since it came out that classes in this prototypical physics department consist of lecturing. And it's expected that lots of students are going to fail. And then in the disciplinary domain, faculty don't inter intervene or don't see it as their business to pay any attention to student student interactions. So this is almost stereotypically bad, but I want to put it up there as a baseline. What I did is I thought about the four domains Collins postulated as making up how power works. And I asked myself, if I went into a physics setting, how, what would I look for to learn about the interpersonal domain? And I decided I would look for how students interact with one another and with faculty, how faculty interact with students and how they interact with one another, et cetera. In the cultural domain, my child is just about to arrive with her snake. Just a moment while I parent. Come quick. Okay. I decided that you could, you all look at what I would look at while I parent. Excuse me, everybody. This is our lives in the pandemic. Okay. And after I decided the things I could look for to help me understand the domains, I asked myself, once I gather that, what should I consider? And I'm going to go in all, I'm going to show you all of this in more detail with actual data. Okay. I'm not going to talk about it, but I put this slide in because it's important to me. This is the epistemological grounding for my study for how I decide what is true and right. And um, I believe that the slides have been shared with you all. Yes, so you can look at all of these slides in more detail if you want. Okay. I gathered this data by <laughs> going to a lot of classes and interviewing a lot of students and a lot of faculty members and running some focus groups. And here's what I found. How do students interact with one another? In the setting I was studying, the physics majors described themselves and one another as friends, friendly, super nice. Here's an example and of this woman. And um, she says she can ask any physics major for help. We're all in it together. Why wouldn't they help me? Okay. How do students and faculty interact with one another? A lot of the women students told me how the faculty are nice and helpful. And I saw the faculty behaving in the way that the students told me. I also, here's what a student said, comfortable talking to any of the professors. And here's what a faculty member said. They try to make themselves available. And how do faculty interact with one another? I really like this bit of data. They seek shared agreement and collaboration. And also the male, the men in the department take responsibility for gender issues. Here's a, some quotes. I love this quote. This, when I collected this, it was from a woman who was pre-tenure and she needed to concentrate on her research in order to get tenure. And she said, it's almost as if because someone else, meaning her two male colleagues who were senior to her, we're thinking about issues of gender. I don't have to waste my brain thinking about it. Someone else has got this. I can just do physics. We're all handling this together. Nobody has to handle it this themselves. 
I'm just gonna leave that quote up for a while because I really love it. So she didn't have an extra cognitive task on top of her doing of physics, which would have been being the defender of all women in physics because the senior male colleagues were doing that and she could just be a normal physics professor seeking tenure. Okay, once I had this data, I asked myself, what do I see along gender and race lines? So first of all, the characteristics of the physics students in this department are stereotypically female, helpful, nice, friendly, responsible, able to work together. This makes it easier for women to step into this physics identity because it's already aligned with things that they are seen as able to do. And note that, um, this is particularly tr true for black women and Latinas because caring is such a high value in this setting. And that's something that whether justly or unjustly is often ascribed to women of color in the United States. A new domain, the cultural domain. What do faculty words and actions convey about shared meanings? Faculty members told me that in this department, good physicists are curious, interested, and engaged, and that they hope that their students will go on to live productive and happy lives, and they don't have to pursue a PhD. Everybody kept telling me that. It, I, it's okay with me if my people don't pursue a PhD. Here's a faculty member. I like this. It does take some confidence to realize you can ask questions and it's not a bad reflection of you. What do students' words and actions convey? They told me that, I asked them what are physics students like here? And they said physics students like knowing how things work, <laughs> spending all their time in the building together. And then I asked myself, what does the setting itself tell us about what's valued? And this setting had open spaces. I understand you all have this too, that you have a lounge. They had open spaces where physics majors work together. And they had posters mimicking the message that the faculty were telling me that they want their students to be able to take on a variety of careers, including, this is my favorite because I'm actually in teacher ed, high school teaching. Here's a faculty member talking to me about the setting and how he feels really ambivalent about having a poster of Einstein on the wall because he thinks it's giving the wrong message and he wants by his actions to give the message, I'm not Einstein and I can still do physics. Okay, so then I asked myself some questions. So at the cultural level, physics students are curious, collaborative and hardworking. And I have had people disagree with this and I'm ha I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I think those characteristics are gender neutral. I'm not, collaborative is a gender neutral, but tinged female to me. You all are gonna tell me what you think. But another thing that's lovely is that in the United States, black women tend to see themselves as, and the data supports this, hardworking and persistent. And so this cultural domain is comfortable and it's particularly comfortable for black women. Okay, structural policies. So this um, department uses the scale-up protocols from the American Physics Society, um, which indicate that professors should use well-designed lab work and high quality student faculty interactions, constant use of formative of clickers. It's a clicker, a strongly clicker department. And they talk a lot, the faculty do about how doing well in this class comes from working hard and practicing. Here's a quote. I'm gonna go on even though that was not too long to read that. Here's another quote talking about active learning and the message is you can be wrong and still be a physicist. Okay, then I asked myself, do these policies 
perpetuator challenge under representation. And again, this is a sharp contrast with the prototypical idea in physics that success comes from hard work. And again, I think hard work and learning and practice are gender neutral and again, particularly comfortable for black women. This is not just happening by coincidence. This emphasis on these more accessible characteristics are being done deliberately by the faculty. And here's a faculty member talking about it. He's talking about that study in um, science where the x-axis is how much people in a discipline believe that, I should put the slide in here, that success in their discipline is due to natural ability. And the y-axis is the percent of women in the field. And it's like this super tight correlation that, disciplines that believe that they require natural genius have far fewer women in them. And I hope it is fair to say that all of us on this call don't believe that intellectual ability is correlated, is related to gender. And so the conclusion is simply emphasizing natural genius when a group of people is unjustly stereotyped as having less of it is one way that to create a setting that's not comfortable for those people who are subject to that stereotype. I hope I said that clearly. Okay, what kinds of student behaviors do faculty correct? And I saw faculty repeatedly intervene in student behaviors that they found were perpetuating different cultural norms than the ones they wanted. For example, um, I was watching two faculty members together run a lab composed of the first year students. And over and over, they were pushing back on the idea that uh, one student said that they should all divide up all the questions so they can finish more efficiently. And the, the faculty member was like, no, the goal is that everybody in a group learns, not that you win and beat another group. And another faculty member was watching a group work and then she intervened because she saw one student kept monopolizing the equipment. So she intervened. And after that, he didn't start sharing the equipment. Instead, he stood at the edge and kind of pouted. And then she came back and intervened again and said, it can't be. I'm either in charge or I'm out of here. That their job is to work together. Okay. Then I, I asked students what kinds of student behaviors they believe that the faculty would correct. I was in a focus group that was just women students. They heard a story about a, well, I've called it a microaggression here, but it was actually pretty much a, an aggression that a black woman experienced at a different university. They were talking about what could be done to make it better. And one woman said, having our professors. And another woman said, I'm sure if I said something to a faculty member, he would pull that person aside. They were confident that their professors would protect them. It was really quite touching. It made me, proud to know these professors. Um, so then I asked myself how these disciplinary norms align with or challenge underrepresentation. And obviously these faculty don't just talk about valuing diversity, they step in and they insist on it. And they have to do it year after year with every group of freshmen. It never, uh, this culture never establishes itself in perpetuity. They create it and create it and create it and create it. So in this setting, this is a summary of everything I just talked about. Oh, it's missing a letter. And they each shared agreement. <laughs> And here's more summary. I'm going to talk a little bit about this and then I'm done talking and I want to um, hear what you all have to say. Okay, so in this setting, physics students are collaborative and friendly. Physics faculty are accessible and helpful. And I want to contrast that with the prototypical department I talked about earlier. So rather than experiencing isolation and microaggressions, students are friendly and helpful. 
Rather than physics being competitive, physics is collaborative. Rather than high levels of student misconception being expected, faculty and students work together closely and faculty are using research on how students learn physics to guide their teaching. And when students try to assert a more typical physics identity, faculty intervene. Okay, this is the end of what I have prepared and I'm gonna stop sharing and I would love to hear what you all think. I understand that um, you have been posting and that I think Lily is going to. Right, right. Thank you, Angela, for very nice talk. So Lily, Lily and uh, Carolina are going to handle the questions and answer session. Oh, good, so if people have questions, I, it sounds like you need to post them. Where yes. should they post? Uh, they can send their, their questions to either Lily or Carolina and they will moderate the question and answer session. Oh, great, so you can post them down in the chat. And because yes. of that, I'm not going to call in anybody. And if you put your hand up, I'm just gonna put it back down again because right. that's not the format we're right. using. Right, it'll be a moderator. Uh, Thank you. Great. Carolina, take it away. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a question already. Um, I guess I should turn off my video. It says, I have observed that in physics settings, there can be critical mass effect, e.g. with women in a group, after the first few join, it becomes like a runaway process until gender parity or even, ex or even an excess of women is achieved. I'm wondering what Dr. Johnson thinks of this observation. I think that is true, although I would love to hear about where you have seen an excess of women, unless it's just in a group. But it's absolutely true that when two women join a lab group, other women are gonna go join that group. And it's really true for women of color. Um, in another study, not this one, uh, a woman told me that she goes to class on the first day and she looks around to see the other women of color because she knows that's who's gonna end up in her lab group. Uh, because of that, I think there's something I just looked at a study that I think is going to come out soon in uh, 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 physical review, physics education research about whether it's worth it to, to, well, anyway, I can't articulate that clearly enough, but there is some reason to think that at minimum, you should not intervene and try to force students to pair up randomly. Um, and possibly you should encourage people to find a lab group they're comfortable with and work in it. The um, folks in the department I studied used a kind of software called CATME, C-A-T-M-E. And I don't know how it worked, but I know that they used it to deliberately form groups and constantly check in and monitor on the, the dynamics in the groups because um, the... Feel in a lab group can make or break a student's experience in a physics setting. So if you want to create a more inclusive class, being very deliberate about group work is a key element. And a person that I talked to in a computer science class told me that he uses a tactic that I really like. He doesn't let students say who they want to work with because sometimes he makes groups deliberately, but he lets students say if there's anybody that they don't want to work with so that he can be certain that he doesn't inadvertently pair a woman student with a person who she would be very uncomfortable with to the point she would not be able to learn because of her discomfort. Carolina. Uh, so we have a, a question that kind of follows a similar vein. So it says, I would appreciate a, I would appreciate specific advice on how faculty can intervene in student-student interactions in the most helpful way. Okay. So first of all, you're not going to feel comfortable when you first start doing it. Because I watched these people do it, I know they weren't comfortable at first. Um, and they had to practice, especially the women faculty were not as comfortable intervening. But they were just, you have to imagine that students are 
using a piece of lab equipment in a way that could be dangerous because you wouldn't hesitate to go and speak to them about that or just using it incorrectly so that it's not going to work and you wouldn't hesitate to correct them. And you, if you are completely sure that students will learn more in your class if a lab is, if a lab group is functioning more effectively, if everybody in the lab is participating more effectively, if you're very sure of that, you're gonna be able to correct them in the same kind of neutral way that you would say you have the oscilloscope probes booked up wrong. Um, it's not gonna be comfortable at first because we have a strong norm in physics that you're not supposed to intervene in social dynamics, but you don't have that norm around other issues that you would correct. Carolina, I'm starting to repeat myself, so. I want to encourage the students and postdocs to ask questions too. So far, we've mostly heard from professors and I would really like to hear from more junior people as well. Like this is a space for everyone. And I would um, also, I have something I would like to ask for. I would like to know what you all, what you all think are the most important larger spheres that affect what shapes culture and especially possible identity spaces in physics settings. Remember I was showing you all of those pictures, like me trying to map out different pictures. What do you think should go where? So if people have ideas about that, I'd like to know. And I'd also like to know if I have, what you all think about the characteristics I've listed as gendered or not gendered. And I would also like to hear from the folks um, who are science education researchers about how they, well, anybody really, about how they think I could refine some of these concepts. So I hope that I've given you questions that will help you um, post in ways that I would really like. Yeah, okay. that's cool. And um, I can see people are giving me direct messages, but I'm not going to read them. So if you want to say something, you have to post it to Lily or Carolina. Okay, go, Carolina. Uh, yeah, so while people think about that and send me a little bit of questions, uh, we do, a question did come in uh, from one of our students that says, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, do you think the emphasis on imposter syndrome in some circles distracts from the bigger group dynamics you've been talking about? I worry sometimes that telling people they have imposter syndrome puts a burden on them to snap out of it when maybe them feeling like an imposter comes from outside. I really I, agree with yes. this question, by the way. <laughs> I, I think uh, imposter syndrome could come from within, but I completely think it's a red herring. I think that what we label imposter syndrome is actually, I'm having difficulty belonging in this setting and, it, and difficulty belonging might come from within, but whew, as a woman who's been in a lot of physics environments, difficulty belonging can come because people are not creating easy ways for me to belong. And they may not even realize that's happening but they're just used to being with people like them and they're not even realizing they're excluding me or they may be deliberately excluding me. As a person in her fifties, I've been deliberately insulted and excluded plenty of times. So I would encourage you all not to talk about imposter syndrome and instead to talk about, um, let's see, mm, for people who have power in the setting to talk about creating more ways for folks to belong and for people who have less power, studying the setting and ask yourself, asking yourself, where is there room here for me to maneuver? Does that make sense? I think imposter syndrome just causes you to look in and you can't solve structural problems from inside of your own psyche. That imposter syndrome hypothesizes that all power is distributed in the interpersonal domain. And I don't think that's accurate. That's a really good thing to think about. I, I admit that I have talked about imposter syndrome and now it's making me reconsider <laughs> some of the ways we talk about it. Um, Carolina, I love it that you are prioritizing the words of students, and I really hope you'll continue to do that. And students, I really hope you'll post. Um, 
We have another question here. So are there other similar buzz phrases like imposter syndrome or common in these sorts of settings that you think are a bit hearing? That's a great question. <laughs> I actually want to say, do you all think there are? But um, that is a great question. Someone suggested implicit bias, and I agree. <laughs> yeah, I tell me why, uh, Carolina, tell me why you what you see about implicit bias. What I say about it. So maybe being a, a red herring. Mm -hmm. Red herring, by the way, I wasn't thinking I was using a very, um, a red herring is a thing that misleads you and directs your attention away from what's really going on, but is very convincing. So you run after chasing it. Uh, my issue with implicit bias is just, it, it's more that people get there and stop there. Right, because it's like, oh, if we all have input, we all have biases as part of being human, which it is, mm -hmm. it's true. Mm -hmm. But then you don't dig deeper into like thinking about what structural systems led you to have those biases and find mm -hmm. ways to dismantle them. So you, so if you just say, oh, I have biases, it's fine. You're kind of not doing the, all the work. You know, I don't know the, if the person... a, another problem with implicit bias is it, um, it also posits that all the difficulties are occurring at the interpersonal level. But um, for example, if a professor is randomly assigning students to lab groups and that is separating the students who already feel they don't belong, none of that is implicit bias. That's a, a policy on the part of the professor that could be easily changed. Um, yeah. Someone even just though I think, something. Uh -huh. let me hear it. Okay. Um, it's really so much that. It says basically part of the issue is that implicit bias removes responsibility from people who are doing the harm. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Uh, I can see Alison Gonsalves just posted one phrase, so I was able to see it in the chat, and that was stereotype threat. And it's true, it's such a powerful concept with a lot of explanatory power. If you're a professor, it tells you things not to do. Basically, if you're, a, does, do you guys think everybody knows what stereotype threat is? I'm gonna define stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is something I recognize clearly from being a smart girl in science in the 1980s in New Mexico. That was not a popular thing to be. Um, so when I was sitting there taking a trigonometry test in high school, I was sitting next to my friend Joe and he was just taking a hard test and I was taking a hard test and proving that I was as smart as Joe. And so it was, his name was really Joe, I didn't just make that up. And it was like putting a drag on my cognition. It was distracting me. So I was not performing as well as I could have performed not because I believed the stereotype, but because the stereotype was so offensive to me that I was distracted by trying to disprove it. The point is that I didn't prove, believe it and that's how it affected me. I think stereotype threat affects women's performance in physics, but <laughs> it is the signal to noise ratio here. It's such a tiny amount compared to how being excluded and receiving microaggressions and not finding a comfortable way to fit in because the people in, with power haven't created an open environment affects women in physics. That's, that's a really good answer. Um, we have another question from a student and one from a prof and I asked the student first, the student question first. So um, I was really happy to see that the students you'd spoken to really feel that faculty would vouch for them when other students were making them uncomfortable. In my experience, most of the uncomfortable physics encounters I have heard about in undergrad and in grad school have involved student-faculty interactions. Right. Have you looked into how faculty members make students feel and whether students feel supported in trying to correct these behaviors? Oh, yeah. Part of the reason this department worked is because none of the physics professors felt entitled to mistreat students. Um, they had a rule. What did they call the rule? Dang, I forgot what they called it, but they had a rule that they never spoke negatively about a student ever. They might talk to one another about a concern they had about a student, but they never just 
criticized, oh, that was the rule. It was the no criticism zone. They never criticized a student. They paid really close attention to their, well, this is implicit bias, but on the part of people in power. They paid really close attention to the way they were thinking of students, making sure that they weren't letting negative views of students even show up in their minds. They could be concerned about a student's difficult performance, but they weren't bad mouthing students, if that makes sense. So they were so far from mistreating a student that they were trying to make sure that even in their minds, they were being respectful. So in my opinion, if there is a faculty member who is treating students with disrespect, again, this is not going to be comfortable, but it is the obligation, the moral obligation of other faculty members to intervene. That is not something a student should have to intervene on and that's not something a student should face. As a department chair, I actually had to do this last week. If there's a situation where a student is uncomfortable, it is my job as the chair, the most, the senior most faculty member to talk to the faculty member about what happened and what they're gonna to do to fix it. If that's happening at an institution that you're part of and you are uh, have some power in that institution, you are failing. I like that. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, so this one is about the matrix of interactions. It's a bit of a long question, so I'm just gonna ask the last bit. It just says basically, is personality an important factor in the dynamics that are playing out in the matrix of inter in this matrix of interaction? Of course, and it's the matrix of oppression. And of course, personality is a key factor. Um, some people are just born more resilient than others. My child who I had to stop this talk for, to pay attention to for a moment, is she was born sensitive. That's why she was born sensitive enough that I'm willing to stop a professional talk to attend to her. Do you know what I'm saying? And I have other friends who everything just rolls off of them. Of course, personality is important, but personality should not having a resilient personality should not be required to succeed in physics. What I mean is everybody has to be resilient in physics around trying a hard problem and failing to get it. That form of resilience is, goes along with the subject matter, but you should not have to be resilient in the face of poor treatment in physics. You should be able to be a physics major and you should expect to be treated with respect and to be included in the activities that help you learn to the same extent other people are, regardless of any uh, factors that divide us as humans, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. And I think another dimension of that question, which I think relates to one of the questions asked earlier is um, kind of like the introversion extroversion of the people who have to like intervene, right? Like it is much easier for some people to step in. Yep. So how does that play out? Well, unfortunately, the ease of enacting our moral obligations that I find some, I, I consider, obviously I consider this a moral obligation and I find some of my moral obligations a lot easier to fulfill than others, but that doesn't make them less of an obligation. Yeah, it's much easier for me to talk to students about their behavior because I'm chatty, but there are other things I find intensely painful, but that I know that I have to do because it's my ethical commitment and I do them. Yay, adulthood. Yeah, I, I can feel that. <laughs> um, so we have time for a couple more questions. I have one more that's been sent in, but if you have like a final question, please do, like send it in now uh, so that we can get to it um, before we run out of time. So this is a bit of a broader question, um, but how how do we balance ideas like merit, fairness, and equality against equity, diversity, and inclusion? Like what's the best way to move forward with discussion and dissent when you're not on the same page? I love that question. Um, it's not clear to me why people think that they are opposed. Like, um, so I, th I think it's a red herring. I think that you can have inclusion. I actually think that if you're not actively seeking to build an inclusive environment, you're likely to be um, 
blowing through people with high levels of talent because they're not, regardless of how talented they are, they're not willing to put up with the BS that you're expecting them to put up with. And I think that is true not only for the people who are experiencing the isolation and microaggressions, shall I say, but for people who are witnessing those and aren't even willing to be in an environment where other people are being subject to disrespectful and uncivil treatment. So I don't think it's a question of balancing them at all. I don't think that you can, I don't think you can create an environment where you are promoting the most meritorious people if some members of your group are being subject to extra obstacles that other group members don't have to deal with. That's the opposite of merit. If you want the best to rise to the top, you have to be sure everybody has the opportunity to enter at the bottom and that nobody's getting knocked out in the process. It's okay if they're knocked out because physics just isn't for them. It's that they're not getting knocked out for reasons that are irrelevant to physics, like their race, their gender, their religion, their accent, their anything. Oh, having a baby, anything, anything that has nothing to do with success in physics. My, oh, I started to say something that Angela and not Professor Johnson would say. It was going to do with my body parts and whether my particular body parts had much to do with my ability to work problems, for example. I have, we have a couple more questions from students and then I think we'll close it out. Um, so, I'm gonna read out the whole comment and then the question for this one because it's very heartwarming. So it says, uh, I wanna say first that hearing about this physics department made me cry with how different it is from most of my experiences. What is it about the institutional structure of this department that made institutional change from what I presume was a more typical past possible? Okay, I love this question. They hired a particular faculty member and you can't hi necessarily hire yourself out of this problem. And I have a second story. Um, but in this case, there were three, fac three physics faculty. They hired a fourth. The fourth one they hired came in with very high status research. And therefore, when he was saying, we need to also be using the physics education research to make sure that all of our students are learning and we have to be making sure that our department is more equitable, they listened to him better because he, his research chops were so good. And he only ever won over one more of the three who were there. But the two of them started trying to build a more equitable department and also one that was using best practices around teaching and then the other two eventually retired. And then the two that were really on board have then hired three more faculty members, all women who were also deeply committed to this. But I know another story, this was of a math department that was also a pretty decent place. And they told me they just started slowly and it built like they would do a little bit and they liked it so much and they felt so much better about their jobs that they do a little more and a little more until they became this really good and positive place. The most, the question I get asked the most is how do I take my department that's only so-so or not even good and make it better? And I get that asked, asked that by professors and I do not know the answer. I don't know a way that always works. I only know some ways that have worked. At least I have lots of work to do for the rest of my career. I guess we have to be not afraid to try. Right? Kind of like try things and see if they work. <laughs> One thing I love about physics, and I still tell myself this, if I get really sick of what I'm doing, I can always go work for industry, even me now with nothing but a bachelor's degree from a long time ago, and I can make more money than I make. <laughs> so may as well work on making your department better because you can go back and make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, okay, we're a bit above time, so I'm just gonna close it out with this final question because it is very relevant right now. Um, so it says, in the context of feeling included, do you think Zoom lectures had a net positive or net negative effect? On one hand, students are largely anonymous gray screens, but on the other hand, students miss the seeing people like me aspect that you highlighted as important. I think that's a great question. And there's another thing, which is that they can ask questions in the chat box without feeling spotlighted. I don't know the answer. I, would, I wonder what you all think. 
all I'm doing is opening and closing my mouth because the last two years have been so different than anything I could have imagined that I don't know. I know that I hate not being able to see you all and I'm glad that I saw lots of you earlier. It's much harder as a professor to teach to nothing. I'm Thank happy so to much stay. Then. Oh yeah, we, we can stay a bit after, but I think we're, we might just need to, like if anyone wants to stay after and ask questions for a few more minutes, we can do that. And I'll let you unmute yourselves. Uh, but for now, I guess I'll pass it on to Sanyo for now. Right. So thank you very much for very, very nice talk and wonderful, wonderful uh, the presentation. I think we have learned a lot. And also there are a lot of things that you have given us that we should think about and also implement. Okay. So as, as you see, you know, a lot of people are virtually applauding you. <laughs> thank you all, everyone. Okay. So this concludes uh, this week's uh, the uh, colloquium and as Karina said if you if you have any questions to, to discuss with the uh, professor Angela Johnson you can remain